He's killed by some horses. Trampled? No, eaten. An old friend of a new series, Benson, tonight at 10.30. Princess Anne has a baby girl. Both are well. Pope's assailant. Police think he didn't act alone. Thousands turn out for Ulster's day of funerals. Air gun attack hits three outside Ripper courtroom. Frank Whittle, father of the jet engine, pleads for Concord. Good evening. Princess Anne tonight gave birth to a baby girl. A sister for Peter, who's now three. And she's the Queen's first granddaughter. The birth came at a quarter past eight, six hours after Princess Anne arrived in St Mary's Hospital in Paddington in West London. She'd been driven there from Windsor Castle. The medical team in charge say both the princess and her daughter are doing well. And Buckingham Palace says the Queen, of course, is delighted. It's not yet known what the new baby will be called, but whatever her name, she'll be sixth in line to the throne. A report now on the Queen's first granddaughter from Tim Yard. The new royal baby at St Mary's Hospital weighs eight pounds one ounce and the news from the hospital is that both mother and child are doing well. Captain Mark Phillips was present at the birth as was the Queen's gynaecologist Mr George Pinker. The princess arrived at the hospital amid strict security early this afternoon. She'd been staying at Windsor Castle with the Queen and Prince Philip. The Queen is expected to see her new grandchild for the first time tomorrow. The first of Princess Anne's royal babies was born, also at St Mary's Hospital in Paddington, on November the 16th, 1977. Peter Mark Andrew Phillips wasn't given a title, and so for the first time in 500 years, the grandchild of a reigning sovereign was born a commoner. Nevertheless, Peter replaced Princess Margaret as fifth in line in succession to the throne. The new baby will be sixth in line. The latest royal will be raised here. Gatcombe Park, the Gloucestershire home of Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips. It's the perfect setting for a growing child. The princess isn't one to let babies or pregnancy interfere with an active life. She is described having children as an occupational hazard of being a wife, pregnancy as boring. She was out in public as late as last weekend at her sister-in-law's wedding. It was Peter's first public appearance. And no one has any doubts that the princess, complete with two children, will soon be out and about in public once more. In Rome, police are saying the man who shot the Pope did not act alone. And they're preparing an identical picture of a man seen running from St. Peter's Square after the shooting. An Italian news agency has released a photograph showing what they say is the gunman preparing to fire in St. Peter's Square. Details in the forged passport of the gunman Mehmet Ali Akcha show that after escaping jail in Turkey, where he was serving a murder sentence, he travelled to seven other countries in Eastern and Western Europe. He spent some time in West Germany, where he's believed to have been sheltered by members of the extremist Turkish Grey Wolves group. He made three recent visits to Italy. In Turkey today, three men, one of them a former senior police officer, were detained for helping Akcha obtain his false passport. The Pope himself, after a painful night, is making better progress, though he's still serious. He's been able to move his arms and legs and gave a papal blessing to his team of doctors and nurses. From Rome, Martin Lewis reports first on the police investigation. As the interrogation of the Pope's attacker continues, Italian police chiefs are becoming increasingly convinced that he did not act alone and that they have the documentary proof for that. Deputy State Prosecutor Luciano Infelici believes that Agco was engaged by an international terrorist group for subversive purposes. And the chief of Rome's anti-terrorist squad, Alfredo Lazzarini, says that rather than being a religious fanatic, Agca is a trained and ruthless terrorist with a capital T. Lazzarini has confirmed that for months, Agca traveled widely throughout Europe on a variety of false passports, flush with money and evading several warrants for his arrest. Police think it would have been impossible for him to do this without some kind of help. And part of that help could have been a second man seen running away from the scene of the assassination attempt in St. Peter's Square. And detectives are well on the way towards completing an identical picture of him, which they hope to release soon. 
Security in and around the hospital where the Pope lies was strengthened noticeably during the day as police reacted to the dramatic results of their investigations. Meanwhile, a hospital bulletin said the Pope continues to recover and is looking noticeably better than he did yesterday. In his windowless room, some 16 feet square, two nurses and a private secretary remain constantly at his side. The hospital's chief medical officer who saw him today described the scene. He is using an oxygen mask. All the time? All the time, yes. But he is able to speak through the oxygen mask, so there is no problem about uh, this. And how is he being fed? Uh, intravenously. He cannot take any? He cannot take any, any food by mouth. Do you think that the Pope will make a full recovery at this stage? Oh, it is not possible to, to give an answer to this question now. Uh, because we stated that the prognosis is still uncertain. So we hope that he will uh, recover fully. And the prayers continue, as here in a Polish church in the center of Rome, and at an international meeting of 30,000 in St. Peter's Square, where a cardinal read a special message from the Pope, written some time ago, which the Pope had planned to deliver himself. Martin Lewis, News at 10, Rome. Mrs. Thatcher has ordered a security inquiry to find out why a copy of her confidential list of engagements was left lying about in the House of Commons. Extracts from her official diary were printed in this morning's Daily Mirror. Officials are worried about the security lapse as the document gives precise details of where Mrs. Thatcher was during the day. And Mrs. Thatcher has rejected an appeal from Ireland's Roman Catholic primate Cardinal O'Fee for a more flexible policy towards the IRA hunger strikers. Her reply to the Cardinal said, The government is not the inflexible party. She accused the IRA of cold-bloodedly deciding that the hunger strikers were of more use dead than alive. In Ulster, four more funerals have taken place. Two of them were Republicans, including hunger striker Francis Hughes. One was a milkman killed on his rounds. The fourth was a 14-year-old girl who died from head injuries during rioting on Tuesday. Thousands turned out for the funeral of IRA man Francis Hughes in County Londonderry. Instead of the usual outfit of combat jackets and dark glasses, his Republican burial party wore masks and formal uniforms. John Underwood reports. The Army and the Royal Ulster Constabulary mounted one of the biggest security operations South Derry has ever seen. Tens of thousands of people flocked to Balaki only to find the village sealed off by RUC roadblocks. The security forces wanted to stop the IRA winning another publicity victory by parading Francis Hughes' coffin through his home village. Insofar as the funeral procession was diverted, it worked. But the IRA still staged an illegal full dress uniform demonstration with at least 16 men and women and a number of weapons. When the prying cameras of a British Army helicopter threatened the IRA men's masked faces, people rushed in to cover them with umbrellas. Eventually, the volley was fired, and the procession moved off. <laughs> 